Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. And uh, it's, it's really been a magical experience to work with the, the library. And congratulations to the Sherlock Knight team. I've been learning a lot about your project as well. So um, I've got quite a lot to cover. And uh, I'm going to be simplifying quite a lot of things with this project. So um, I know Ben Osteen is here somewhere. So I have copious amounts of notes from our meeting. So I don't want to insult you by oversimplifying everything that um, we've been doing together. Um, so my initial proposal built on the subjects of my PhD, which focuses on black abolitionists, most of them are formerly enslaved, who visited Britain between the 1830s and um, the 1890s. And African Americans visited Britain for a variety of reasons. Many came to publish slave narratives, uh, teach Britons about slavery, and look for support uh, for the abolitionist cause. And others came to live in Britain uh, safely away from the eyes of their former slave masters or um, slave hunters as well, slave catchers. So one of the main aims of this project was to sort of uncover hidden histories. So one of the most important things I wanted to highlight in this presentation was obviously hidden figures or the figures um, that this project is about to sort of humanize this, this digital project. So on the left, we have Frederick Douglass, who I'm hoping some of you would have heard of. Uh, he was uh, born in slaves and escaped to become one of the most famous African-Americans of the 19th century. In the middle, we have Ellen Craft, who I'm going to be talking a little, about, a little bit about later. Uh, she escaped slavery with her husband and dressed as a white southern, southern slaveholder. Um, and the guy on the right there, or sort of your left, I suppose, my left, your right, Josiah Henson. Uh, he was the only black man to exhibit something at the Great Exhibition in 1851. And he became so famous in the late sort of 19th century that he was invited to meet Queen Victoria and actually Man Empty Swords uh, made a wax model of him, which is quite unusual. I was inspired to apply for the competition by last year's winner, Katrina Navracas, and her project focused on the Chartist movement, and in particular, she used the 19th century digitized newspaper database to find locations of Chartist meetings up around the country. And Katrina and the lab's team wrote code to identify these meetings in the Chartist newspaper, and churned out hundreds of results that would have taken her years to search for manually. And I wanted to do the same thing, but with black abolitionist speeches. And I've spent years manually searching for traces of abolitionists, like the three people you see here, uh, transcribing their speeches, finding adverts, um, showcasing their lectures. And if I was to use a search engine on the Gale Cengage uh, sort of digitized newspaper database, if I typed in Frederick Douglass, this is sort of one of the results that you would see. So you can see uh, Douglass's name is highlighted. But there was a sort of an inherent problem with my project in the sense that uh, the scale sort of, as I mentioned, abolitionists were traveling and giving lectures between the 1830s and the 1890s, and that's quite a large chunk of time compared to the last project where you're looking at the Chartists, it was only you know, a couple of years or so. And the other, I suppose, problem for this project as well is that these abolitionists were giving speeches everywhere around the UK, not, in, not only in the major cities, but also in small villages as well. So their, their lectures are represented across the newspapers from the London Daily News to the John O'Groats Journal, for example. So the, the date range was actually one of the most difficult things that we came across and actually how to sort of come up, basically how to sort of deal with that challenge really, which I'll sort of talk a little bit more about how we responded to that a little bit later. Another problem we had to consider was uh, poor OCR, which OCR stands for Optical Character Recognition, and it refers to scanned images that have been turned into machine readable text. And in terms of errors, um, I think Melissa sort of touched on this earlier, but the OCR process can uh, contain, obviously, errors just within that process. So misspelled words, substitutions, uh, lost or missing text. And it also does contain errors as well sometimes. So E, for example, the letter E is, can be scanned in as O or C, uh, M as NI or RN. And there are numerous factors influencing the quality of the OCR. And um, particularly with the newspapers, it can be the paper that the newspaper, newspaper is printed on, uh, the font, the, um, the layout of the newspaper, as well as the, the resolution and the file format as well. And one of the main things about this project was this idea that if the OCR was patchy or quite poor, there are hundreds of references to people like Frederick Douglass or other hidden figures that we just can't access. And just to give you an example, um, we found a couple, a couple of uh, examples in the newspapers where the term Frederick had been spelt 
um, F question mark I each uh, E H R I C K. So if you try to type in Frederick Douglass as I've done here, it wouldn't have necessarily thrown back that results of um, Frederick with an exclamation mark in the middle. Um, so we wouldn't have, that result would have been hidden from us using the search engine. And you might not be able to see this particularly well, but there's a couple of examples again of poor OCR. So the top one, um, sort of free Eric, free Eric Douglas. And at the bottom, um, there's actually a reference to fugitive slaves, but the slavery is actually, or slave, sorry, is actually spelled S-A, kind of squiggly line X. So, of course, that's another aspect of this particular article might be hidden from a normal um, sort of search engine. And we experimented a bit with OCR correction, and um, I'll talk a little bit about um, that later. So some of the next steps that we thought about was um, trying to use machine learning um, as part of this project. And uh, machine learning is separated into supervised and unsupervised learning, I'm sure some of you are aware. Uh, the former refers to teaching a program how to do something and the algorithm is given data, which is kind of told the correct answer for each example. And unsupervised refers to a program sort of learning by itself. So we provide the data and ask it to create a structure and find patterns. And it was that last one that we were kind of mainly interested in. So we needed to come up with uh, a training uh, data set. And that data set actually came from um, a mini archive that I'd built up over the last few years. I was sort of mentioning that I transcribed hundreds of uh, articles and I had all the references, I had all the articles there. And something that became really important within that uh, sort of mini archive and all those references was key terms or sort of positive words that we would try and teach the computer to find in other examples. So some of the words obviously used to describe these individuals are uh, words like Negro, fugitive slave, um, coloured, and also the, the types of words that, um, that Ben actually found um, in some of the earlier sort of training sets was that the you know, words like pro-slavery and slavery, sort of those are the words that came up most frequently in these lectures, which obviously should make sense. Um, detersive is one that I think we weren't quite sure about, but um, obviously all the other ones uh, seem to make more sense. So as well as building up this sort of corpus of positive words and positive phrases um, that we would want the computer to try and find, um, we also had to provide a sort of negative set. So I found some references to lectures uh, about prison reform and church meetings and church financial meetings. And obviously just giving the computer something to say, OK, we don't really want to search for these, but this using that as a kind of control method. And... One way through this, actually, I should mention, um, to sort of tackle the OCR errors I mentioned earlier, is um, Ben Osteen of the, um, of the lab's team. I used a process called the Levenstein distance, which I'm hoping I'm pronouncing it right, Ben. And um, basically what that is, it's a formalized way of saying a word is X number of steps away from another word. So, for example, you know, the number of adding or subtracting letters to get from slave to stove would be two. So the Levenstein distance would be two. So in the training set, Ben looked for um, OCR error words that were one or two distances away from the word we wanted. So, for example, abolition, sort of to try and, you know, even if the OCR was poor, we could try and sort of harness those results as well. So all of this data, this sort of corpus of text, is built into um, a classifier. And a classifier is a type of pattern recognition. So these classifiers will read the OCR and sort of collect newspaper references, but they work differently to a search engine because it measures words by weight and frequency. So it also relies on probability. So, for example, if there's an article that mentions fugitive and slave in the same section, it's likely it's talking about someone we want to look at, for example, Frederick, Doug Fre Fre Frederick, Frederick Douglass even, sort of fugitive slave Frederick Douglass. Now, sometimes if you use a search engine and you use the terms fugitive slave, the, the search engine will basically um, sort of pick up a page where there might be an article talking about a fugitive in this article on the same page and then slave in another article. So it's completely two separate things, and obviously that result isn't as useful for us. And um, Ben created several classifiers, each with sort of four results. So one we sort of termed abo mentions, which um, there were references that refer to abolitionist speeches. Uh, Non-abo speeches, which was a short term for those articles that were sort of talking about um, abolition or slavery, um, but weren't necessarily speeches. Um, a miscellaneous one, and then also a control. So obviously the references that we wanted to avoid. And we're actually still processing the results as well. So we're taking the average of each of those results and it provides sort of a good list for me to sort of manually check. 
So, for example, Liverpool Mercury, um, actually I could use an example here. So, Anjo is a code for the Aberdeen, Aberdeen Journal, uh, 1845, so the 12th of March, 1845, and page 3, for example. Um, so, I would sort of manually use the Gale Sengage um, digitised newspaper database to search that particular page and obviously see if the classifier came up with a good result in terms of an abolitionist, abolitionist speech or whether it was something like a false positive where it did necessarily use those terms but it wasn't exactly useful for us. And we're still processing the results and sort of justifying, sorry, adjusting the uh, classifier to sort of try and reach a higher accuracy. And so far, we've found some really interesting results. So one of the earlier results that we had was um, a reference to an article about a West Indian lion tamer, which is this amazing piece of hidden history. And the reason why that came up was because he was described as a Negro. So using those sort of positive words, obviously, you know, brought back this example of um, this sort of lion tamer, but obviously not exactly what we were hoping to search for. And another false result that we had was actually about ants. And there was this long article uh, that Ben found. Um, it was a really curious find about this sort of long article about um, uh, ants. I can't remember exactly where it was, but I just read you the sentence um, that you can understand why the classifier sort of brought back this result. And it said, the fight itself was over and the red ants, who were the invaders, were taking the black ants prisoner and carrying them off as slaves. So it's a very, very, very bizarre language. You can again see that technically uh, it works because, you know, this is a really, this is the language that we kind of want to search for, but obviously not particularly in the right context. And the other thing as well, um, I sort of mentioned that I'd come back to the, the date problem. Um, we found that there are a lot of references from the 1830s and the 1860s. So before that we actually had a look at whether some of these references would be uh, relevant, it was clear to us that in the 1830s, a lot of those references would be about chartism because the charters use a lot of language like white slavery and they would compare the working conditions of uh, white people here to, um, uh, for example, the black slaves in America. Um, in the 1860s as well, the American Civil War between 1861 and 1865 obviously meant that there are thousands, really, of newspaper articles talking about slavery and the fugitive slaves and um, African Americans in the US. So what we did to sort of combat, uh, again, this date problem is restrict the, the date parameters. So we decided to run the classifier again between 1845 and 1860. And we're just sort of looking through those results now, and already um, they're proving a lot more positive. So I just wanted to um, show you one of the speeches that um, we found that actually um, hasn't been published before, and it's one that I haven't seen through sort of through my years of looking through the newspapers. Um, and it's really sort of highlighting um, so far really the success of this project because we're looking for sort of hidden voices and speeches that we haven't seen before. And it was a speech given by Frederick Douglass in 1846 in August in London. And so he's passing an anti-slavery uh, resolution at a particular meeting. And um, he says, obviously, he's against slavery. And that the American slaveholders, with their abettors and apologists, are to be charged with denying God as the beneficent creator and common father of the human race and the gospel of Christ, as of universal obligation and value, with perpetrating heathenism under the penalties of law, with overthrowing the marriage institution and destroying all parental and filial relations by legalizing the traffic in slaves and the souls of men, and with exalting the man-stealer above all that is called good. Hence, it is the sacred duty of the friends of freedom throughout the world to bear their testimony against all such as the enemies of mankind, and to combine in every suitable way for the overthrow of that system, which, sustained as it is in the name of Christianity and republicanism, strengthens the power of tyrants and obstructs the progress of liberty in all countries. So powerful words from a powerful man, and I think it really, really highlights uh, one of the things that we were obviously at the start of the project really looking for, and um, again, just really positive so far. So... Aside from um, the, the classifier and those results, we've also been looking at ways about how to correct the OCR. So we were working with um, the Impact Center of Competence and to consider the benefits of re-OCRing the whole collection of digitized newspaper database, which, and again, the results are really promising, but it's, it probably could, should be done on the whole of the 19th century newspaper database, but obviously you can imagine that would be a cost problem involved in that. And uh, it would be lovely if the, the library could get some, some support to do sort of more research into this, um, to sort of see more, uh, see what else, what other history can be unearthed, really. 
And we also worked with a company in Canberra called Overproof, who specialise in OCR uh, correction. And again, they've provided really promising results. So I provided them with some transcripts of some of the speeches that I'd found. And you can see on the slide, in, uh, on the left um, is the OCR, and the middle is what the um, company have corrected, and on the right is the transcription. So the highlighted green is obviously something that their program have corrected. So for example, Brighton had a hyphen in it, and they've put Brighton together, for example. And this is a, a, another example. It's not actually about um, an abolitionist speech, but you can see on the left that there is quite some, some poor OCR on some of those words, especially the title. But even the OCR program could necessarily correct all of the title there as well. So it's a, a work in progress, I think, but some really, really interesting uh, results. Uh, just to mention as well, um, I've been, uh, I used to have a, web well, I had a website called uh, www.frederickdouglasinbritain.com, very originally named, and as part of this project, uh, I was sort of inspired to work with uh, my colleagues, uh, Professor Zoe Trod at Nottingham, and Dr. Mike Gardner, um, at also at the University of Nottingham, to um, improve the aesthetics of my website and also the mapping technology, which I'd um, started uh, very crudely. So this is the new site, so obviously it looks sort of more aesthetically pleasing, and a little bit more professional. Um, and originally, these are the two maps that I designed. So on the left are the speaking locations of Frederick Douglass in Britain, and on the right, there are some other black abolitionists as well in Britain during the same time frame, 1830s to the 1890s. And um, obviously, as you can see, the improvement from the previous slide to this slide, um, it's a lot more professional, and it's um, a lot more sort of, yeah, pleasing to look at, really. Um, but the, the reason why I mentioned the maps is not only a sort of aside from this project as well, but what's really interesting actually is um, the connections to the Living Knowledge Network. So, for example, um, when I was showing this map, instantly I could see, well, in all of these places, um, abolitionists spoke and lectured. So it sh hopefully this project should sort of inspire um, others to sort of take up, um, you know, this history in their own sort of archives and libraries around the country because it's this incredible history that um, we really need to do more about. We had an amazing performance here at the library celebrating um, the fugitive slaves, William and Ellen Craft. So Ellen was um, the, the woman I showed you earlier. And Joe Williams uh, is an actor and researcher who has performed as numerous people like Frederick Douglass and the black circus entertainer Pablo Fanke. And he was actually writing a play about the crafts. And because it fitted so well with our projects, we invited Joe and an actress named Martel Edinburgh, who played Ellen, down to London for a performance. And it went incredibly well. We had a lot of positive feedback. And I just want to play a little clip of the performance. Um, and just sort of 30 seconds or so um, at the start of the performance, um, which included a, a mime of how William, uh, Ellen's husband, is sort of helping her dress to become this sort of southern slaveholder. And obviously, it was an incredibly difficult and dangerous thing to do. So um, she obviously had to work her way up to do it and build the confidence. So if you can play the clip, that would be great. Thank you. So if you are in Leeds anytime soon, then I urge you to go and see it because it's a brilliant performance. And the other event that we've organised is a black abolitionist walking tour. So looking at some of the newspaper articles that um, I found, sort of talking about these, um, these men and women, um, I've sort of pointed out at, at least, well, there could be more, but uh, in terms of a good walking tour, I found six walking uh, sites that sort of highlight this history because... What I wanted this project to show, and actually just generally about my work, is that we are walking past sites that are so important to black British history, to British history, and we're unknowingly walking past these, um, these sites where black activists made a huge impact on British society, and these should be highlighted. So that's sort of rough... Um, outline of the of the walk and um, the woman on the right is Ida B. Wells who was a famous activist against lynching of um, black Americans in the US and she traveled here uh, twice in the 1890s and I'm going to be talking about her on the shore. 
And um, just to sort of highlight that this project also had links with the sort of the Flickr collection as well. Um, and the horrible yellow arrow in the middle there is pointing towards Exeter Hall, which is uh, which was sorry a site of social reform where there'd be lectures there against sla uh, sorry against slavery, um, drunkenness, uh, basically all the sort of you know typical reform um, uh, elements of the 19th century. So. Just to finish up, um, I do have a slide here with um, people to thank, and I'm sure I've forgotten someone, so I really apologise if I have. Um, and just to sort of finish to say that I hope the project will inspire others to research and use digital scholarship to find more hidden voices in the archives. And in terms of uh, black history specifically, uh, people of colour were actors, sailors, boxers, students, authors as well as lecturers, and there's so much to uncover about their contribution to British history. And my personal journey with the library and the labs team has also been a very rewarding experience. I'd never heard of machine learning or uh, any other terms like that, so I've learned a lot over the last few months. And it's sort of further convinced me that in my work and for other academics as well, that we need stronger networks of collaboration between scholars and computer scientists and just the value of digital humanities in, in general, really. And academics can really harness the power of technology to bring their research to life, which is you know, an important and necessary tool for public engagement, I think. So I hope to continue working with the labs team, fine-tuning fine some of the results, as well as some, writing some new pages about uh, black abolitionists for uh, the new website, hopefully. And just to lastly say, I'm very grateful to the library and the LAMS team for their support and patience in particular when I couldn't understand certain technological words and uh, the LAMS team in general for um, just the amazing opportunity and um, sort of I see this project with its sort of combination of manual and technological methods as sort of a larger model of how we should move forward in the future. So thanks very much. Um, so we, we do have time for, uh, for a couple of questions. So we've got one down here, and can I get another one? Can we get another one queued up as well if... if um I just wondered about the black abolitionists walking tour, because I noticed it sold out very, very fast. Mm -hmm. And I just wondered if there were any plans to already repeat it, or to maybe create a new app around it, Thank you. Um, if there's interest, I can do a second one. So <laughs> maybe we should get a you know word document somewhere and then put it up in. But um, I'm actually going to be uh, making a digital project with um, the University of Nottingham's uh, Rights and Justice Research Priority Area, um, which is just sort of briefly the sort of largest collection of um, scholars. Uh, it's about 700 of us who work on rights and justice in the world, and that's based at Nottingham. They have um, a digital resource, so I'm going to be putting this walking tour. Um, online, so it can be available to obviously look at, um, you know, across the, across the world. But yeah, if there's interest for the walk, then I'd happily do it several times. So <laughs> thank you very much for that. Um, yeah, it's a good question. Um, I um, basically would download... So you'd have, if, if, for example, if you use the Gail Sengai um, digitised newspaper but database, if you ever used it, you can download a PDF of a particular newspaper article. But what we're working with, and I should have mentioned, is the XML... Um, XML pages. Um, so that was a um, resource that we use that I sort of accessed here from the library. Um, and then um, the only other time I sort of used sort of the kind of manual process of going through the Gale Sengage again was um, sort of in the last few weeks when I've been checking the results and sort of saying, okay, there might be a reference in the Aberdeen Journal on the 12th of April, 1846, and I would sort of manually put the date in uh, and then have a look at that page because it was the easiest way um, for me to check whether there was a reference to American slavery because I found that interface easier to, than to deal with the an XML page um, because as well, if you had an XML page and you were to try and, um, you know, try and search for a word in that particular um, in, that, in, in that particular page, if the OCR was poor, then it's not going to come across. It's not going to come up in your search anyway. So I wanted to sort of manually do it through Gaussian engage. It took longer, but it was a lot more. It's a lot easier to do that. If that answers your question. Do we have a, another question? Uh, 
No? No. Good. So, so, so thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and I'll, I guess I'll, I'll say um, I learned a, a lot from this project. Uh, myself, uh, I think both about the, some of the challenges of using these digitized historical archives um, um, in slightly different ways, but also a lot about uh, the African American presence uh, here in Britain and how their performances and lectures, you know, influenced and, and reached out um, across the country. So uh, I thought it was fascinating, both from the, uh, the kind of the the technical uh, and digital perspective, um, but also in um, you know, my uh, awareness and, and increase in understanding um, as well. So I thought it was a fascinating project and uh, thank you again for uh, uh, participating in, in the lab. So um, uh, just a, a final uh, uh, thanks to uh, Hannah for her work. Mm -hmm.